<laughs> so Cam got her degrees, bachelor's and PhD at Stanford. Stanford, she, her advisor was uh, Aaron Kapitolnik. She's a uh, younger sister of Andy Kent, academic sister. Um, from Stanford, she went to IBM, and then she took a prestigious Dickey Fellowship at Princeton, where she was supposed to work with me and with Poinot, but she soon took off back to IBM in Yorktown Heights, and she worked with John Kirkley on scanning squid microscopy, and she's been doing it ever since, essentially. That was probably a good move. Anyway, um, she's one... She's done lots of great stuff with scanning squids, which you'll hear some about today, but also magnetism, mostly magnetism and superconductivity. Um, she's a member of the National Academy. She won the Macmillan Prize in condensed matter physics. She won also the Richtmeyer Memorial Award from the American Association of Physics Teachers. She's been for the past five years, is it? Uh, Vice President and uh, Dean of Research. And she saw the light, maybe, and went back to the lab, which is where she's reporting from now. Um, so thank you, Pam. Welcome. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Javad, for hosting me. And thanks, Andy, for inviting me. Andy, I'm sorry that I couldn't be here when you were here. Um, I've really enjoyed the day so far. This is actually my first scientific visit post-pandemic. And as Paul said, I've been a full-time administrator for the last five years, so it's really wonderful to start my journey back into science by visiting a place that's doing so many things that I'm interested in. Um, I know that some people have to sign off uh, relatively early in the talk, so I want to start by explaining my main message. Um, unquantized uh, vortices um, in superconductors. Sorry, I'm distracted by the yeah, sign what is about that? the, I don't know if there's a you way can to close uh, it. You yeah. can close it. Right? Um, yeah. Okay. So I think if I click X, good, excellent. Um, oh, nope. I'll let you do it on that one. Good, thanks. OK. So um, superconductors support vortices, which are whirlpools of superconducting electrons, if you like. And normally, the fact that superconductors are quantized fluid, are, 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 um, are quantum fluid, results in the vortices being quantized. Um, that is still the case in the material that I'm going to talk about today, but imagine that you only have a single fluid. Let's call it the purple fluid. Um, and you have a vortex in a purple fluid. And so you have these whirling superconducting electrons. Um, yeah, they don't actually whirl out like this. There's a 1 over r velocity profile, just like in a conventional vortex. Um, but the quantum nature of the superfluid means that the amount of magnetic flux that's carried by these swirling superconducting electrons is quantized and you need a phi naught equals hc over 2p. Now, there's a couple of different ways to get partial vortices or fractional vortices, some of which have been explored by my group and by other groups in the course of the past 25 years. Um, but uh, there's one idea um, from a theorist named Igor Babaev that um, more senior, more knowledgeable people in the field told me wasn't possible, so I never took it all that seriously. Uh, but Igor Babaev said, suppose you have a multiband material that goes superconducting, and you have two order parameters. Maybe the coupling between the two order parameters could be sufficiently weak that you could get, let's say that you had a fluid that's made up of a pink fluid and a blue fluid. Maybe you could have a vortex in the pink fluid and a vortex in the blue fluid, which normally would make one vortex in the purple fluid. But maybe if you have just the right value of the coupling between them, they could separate. And then you would have a vortex that's unquantized because the amount of flux that it carries would be determined by the ratio of the superfluid density in the pink and blue fluids. And as I say, Igor Babaev has been asking us to look for this for 20 years. You know, whenever we're looking at a material where you might see it, we've kind of taken a look and not seen it. And more senior people with what I thought were more microscopic uh, model credibility told me it wasn't possible. But um, my uh, senior staff scientist, Yasuki Yaguchi, um, oh, 
my slides are not advancing now. There we go. Um, Yusuke Gucci uh, looked in the material where Igor Baba Ev told us to look and found um, unquantized vortices of this type. So that's the main message of the talk. Um, now, in terms of this being a colloquium, normally in a colloquium it's kind of fun to talk about multiple different topics. Um, and especially when I haven't given a colloquium in a couple of years, I was really tempted to talk about a number of different things, but since we're so excited about this result right now, I thought I would really just concentrate on this one result and, and take everybody through this result. And um, actually, I want to tell a story about Paul Chaikin if I can. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually, uh, so when I was, it's almost more story about me, but when I was a postdoc at Princeton, um, I was planning to stay for three years, but suddenly at the beginning of my second year, I got a number of opportunities to interview for job talks at the kind of schools that are very difficult to say no to. So I agreed to go to those interviews, but I was worried because I didn't feel like done enough on my postdoc. I was a little nervous, but um, so but I but I wasn't worried about giving a talk because you know I knew I gave good talks. People always told me you gave a good talk, so I thought I'd give good talks. Went to Berkeley. I gave a disastrous job talk at Berkeley, honestly. The next day, I sat with John Clark, a senior person in our field, who explained to me like why it wasn't a good job talk and why Berkeley probably wasn't going to be able to make me an offer that year. I was so sad. I went back. I saw Paul in the hallway. Paul said, how was it? I explained to Paul what had happened. And Paul, Paul and Shivaji Sony came by, too. And Paul and Shivaji said, OK, let's see. We both can get free by 7 PM tonight. You're giving us your job talk. Be in the seminar room at 7 PM tonight. So I gave you guys my job talk at 7 p.m. and I was on my second slide when Paul said, oh wow, this is really good that we're doing this. <laughs> uh, this is not a good job talk because I had a talk at MIT like three days later. So Paul and Shivaji taught me how to give a good job talk and I got the rest of the offers. So thank you very much, Paul. Um, but one of the things that Paul taught me is when to say I and when to say we. But now that I always, already have tenure, I'm completely free to be very clear that Dr. Iguchi is the person who really did, who really did the work that I'm talking about today. OK. Um, let me say a little bit about the field of quantum materials. As you know, um, materials have atoms, and atoms have electrons. And sometimes the electrons in materials can do interesting things. Electrons uh, carry both spin and charge, and they, they're fermions. And so they're already pretty complicated to talk about just by virtue of being fermions. Um, in most materials, you can uh, simplify your understanding. You know, you have like a lot of electrons in there and a lot of nuclei as well. And the energy scales of how the electrons and the nuclei all come together to form a material is a very different energy scale than the energy scale of like things that happen that are interesting in the material once it's formed. And that's part of why the field of condensed matter physics is so interesting, because you almost have to make bad approximations or even bad guesses in order to be able to model anything. Um, but in many materials, there's this like almost miraculous um, simplifying um, effect that uh, because of the uh, repetitive translational invariance of the material, you can, get, you can get band structure. And many people thought that once band structure was invented, that condensed matter physics was you know, pretty much like solved and done. Nevertheless, it's still very interesting to engineer the band structure. And as you all know, there are many atoms on the periodic table. And you can arrange those atoms in many, many very interesting ways. And as a result, result, you can get a lot of different crystal structures with a lot of different atoms that give you a lot of different kinds of band structure. It's also the case that electrons are very light. And because electrons are very light relative to other particles, their de Broglie wavelength tends to be pretty long. And that means that you can see interesting, like just sort of naive wave-like quantum effects in many electronic materials. In fact, when um, when you, uh, as a freshman, read Feynman's lectures on physics, you know, and you read about quantum mechanics, and he talks about the you know, thought experiment of making an interferometer with electrons, you know, and he says that you couldn't do it, but actually you really can do it. It's really not that hard to make an interferometer with electrons and really see wave-like behavior, which is pretty cool. Um, as I already mentioned, materials are made of many, many, many components, and sometimes they're in a nice crystal structure where it's really easy to say what they should look like. But the really interesting thing happens when you have inhomogeneity and disorder or non-traditional lattice structures in those crystal structures, and that can give you very interesting materials, uh, very interesting properties. Also, electrons being fermions, 
their behavior is very highly correlated and the correlations can be quite difficult to model and can lead to very interesting additional behavior. And then most recently, people have been very interested in the topological and the effects that you can have when you have topological band structure, which gives you properties on the edges of the material that you wouldn't necessarily see or be able to probe if you were just looking at the middle of the material. So all of these different knobs and features gives you an incredibly interesting set of things to study. Um, and when I was talking to the students before this colloquium, I really liked the tradition of having the students here. Um, people were asking, so how do I feel about condensed matter physics right now? Um, when I started studying condensed matter physics 25 years ago, I really hoped that by now, we would have reached the point where we could really predictively model these materials and search through them, and that by doing so, we would discover transformative technologies. And I would say we haven't reached that point yet, but I truly deeply believe that given advances in understanding, advances in characterization, and above all, advances in computation, we are very, very close to the era where it's going to be an amazing time to be a condensed matter theorist, especially one with a lot of computational chops who pays like actual attention to actual physical materials. So I hope that this talk, in addition to showing you why we think we found these fractional vortices, I hope that this talk will also give those of you who aren't in condensed matter physics a flavor of what it's like to work in quantum materials today. Okay, so um, one of the things that happens in quantum mechanics is uh, the aharonov foam effect. You may have studied this in quantum. If not, it's an awesome problem for a ball foam exam. So imagine that you have an electron beam split into two paths. The paths pass around a solenoid or some other source of magnetic flux. <laughs> Um, and the uh, electrons are described by this Hamiltonian, which includes both the gradient term and a magnetic vector potential term. Um, and then the left-going electrons um, pick up a phase of the charge <coughs> times uh, the flux divided by 2 h-bar. And the right-going electrons pick up the opposite phase. And then depending on, you know, whether the relationship between those two phases, you get either constructive or destructive interference. So this is a very well-known effect. It's very beautiful to look at in the lab. It's actually a fantastic way to study electrons and materials because um, you, can, uh, you can put a little, some kind of little detector here and tune the phase and kind of see quite a lot about what's going on in various ways. One of the ways that you can do this is that if instead of having these two beams, you just have a ring, of course, in a ring, the phase has to be single-valued modulo 2 pi. Um, and you know what it means to be single-valued modulo 2 pi depends on what the flux quantum is. If you're looking at charge E carriers, the flux quantum is H over E. Charge 2E flux carriers, uh, charge 2E charge carriers is H over 2E, and so on and so forth. And so looking at things as a function of the flux, or looking at the flux as a function of what the things are doing, is a great, great way to probe any um, uh, phase coherent state that's charged. Um, okay, so what is an example of a phase coherent state that's charged? You know, superconductivity was discovered in 1911. Um, and actually, it's kind of, it's reassuring a little bit, isn't it? To realize that superconductivity was discovered in 1911 and flux quantization wasn't discovered until 50 whole years later. Like, if you ever feel like science has slowed down, it hasn't slowed down compared to that. Um, but anyway, so 50 years after the discovery of superconductivity, people discovered flux quantization. It's actually kind of interesting sociologically to look at the discovery of flux quantization. There was this issue of physical review letters where there were these two experimental papers back to back. Um, this is the one from Stanford, my home institution. And I gotta say, it's a really um, <laughs> almost audacious example of lines drawn to guide the eye. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Imagine that there are no points in between. Yeah. Especially um, the top one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's also kind of interesting that they cited the prediction by London and Onsager saying that predict unit was HC over E. And then they were bold and, and they pointed out that it was HC over 2E with an experimental error. And of course, they knew perfectly well that, for, I'm sure, I, I don't actually, I've never talked to them, but I can't imagine they didn't know that four years earlier the BCS theory had been published. And so, you know, it was so very, very interesting that it was HC over 2E, right? Because it meant that there were Cooper pairs forming. 
Um, so that's pretty cool. There was a more sober group of experimentalists that published in the same um, journal. And I would say their raw data was quite a bit better. Uh, but on the other hand, they were like less bold. They basically said that predicting was HC over E. Um, the experimentally observed interval was 40% of the expected value. And the reason for this discrepancy is not clear. So they were very bold and cautious and left it, really left it to the theorists to say, 2E, that's so cool, which is not something that I think most modern experimentalists would do, however cautious they are. Okay, so um, the way that this shows up in a superconductor is through a vortex. So imagine that you have, so this is the vortex in a classical fluid. Imagine that you have a vortex in a quantum fluid. It actually can look a lot like this. There's superfluid flow. The superfluid flow you know, gets faster and faster as you get to the center until it becomes so fast that you have a core of the vortex where superconductivity is destroyed and you have normal electrons. Um, the vortex can also wind like this uh, vortex. So there's quite a lot of similarities. But as I said, the main, one of the main differences is that vortices and superconductors are quantized. Um, Another thing that's different is how you look at them. So this is another example of a vortex. This one uh, in more of a relatively 2D material. For hurricanes, the atmosphere is relatively 2D compared to the scale of the vorticity. Um, but you know, when you look at this vortex, you're imaging it with light. So imaging clouds with light is relatively straightforward because you know clouds do change. Clouds do interact with light quite strongly, and light travels in straight lines. And so imaging with light is awesome because you can look at things that are a long ways away and they look exactly the way that they would look, right? You just, lights just traveling in straight lines. And magnetic fields aren't like that. So imaging the magnetic field, if this were a whirlpool of superconducting electrons, it would be creating a magnetic field, which you could use to see it. Um, but uh, the magnetic field would spread out quite quickly um, as, you, as you leave the material. Um, and that makes it harder to see. But if you go sufficiently close to the surface, you know, it might look like this. Um, that's actual data. But if you back up from the surface, so this is an image of those three vortices where we're scanning a micron above the surface. This is actually a scan with the magnetic force microscope. And you know, what you see is they look pretty blobby. And if we went to two microns, you wouldn't even see them because they would just be really completely spread out. So you really have to go quite close to the surface of the sample um, in order to get a pretty good image of the vortices. Okay, so I and other people um, find a number of really good reasons for looking at vortices. The image I just showed you was taken with a magnetic force microscope by Ophir Oslander when he was in my lab. Um, as Paul mentioned, uh, I've, I've mostly found scanning squid microscopy to be pretty useful, although I've experimented with a number of different magnetic imaging techniques over the years. I like scanning squid microscopy because it's very quantitative and it's very non-invasive. Um, this is an example of the active part of a squid. This is a pickup loop. This particular pickup loop is 500 nanometers across. Um, and then this gray thing is also a superconducting line. And we can use this gray coil to apply a local magnetic field if we want to. Um, these particular, this particular image I'm showing you here was fabricated in collaboration with Texas Instruments and their Houston facility. Um, most of the squids that we use today are fabricated um, in collaboration with IBM. So we basically take something that looks pretty much like this, and we take this sensor, and then we take it and we turn it over the surface of the sample, and we scan it back and forth, and we look at the magnetic fields produced by the sample in a relatively non-invasive way. It's a pretty cool way to find out what's going on in materials because you don't have to pass a current or shine any light on the sample. Nothing is completely non-invasive, but this is pretty darn non-invasive. Okay, so we have that squid, we scan it back and forth. The spatial resolution that we have depends both on the height of the pickup loop above the surface as well as the size of the pickup loop. Sometimes you want a big pickup loop for more sensitivity in certain quantities. Often you want the smallest pickup loop you can get. This is an image of a vortex which provides a monopole-like source of magnetic flux. So that's basically a measurement of the point spread function of the squid right there. Um, and this is, a, 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 I think that's a 500 nanometer scale bar there. Okay. So uh, it's, it's not nearly as simple as the image that I just showed you. Um, the squids that we use are in an 11-layer planarized process. They're designed for scanning. They have a linear response. We have the on-ship field coil that I mentioned before. And we have a shielded and gradient metric design so that we're not too sensitive to external magnetic fields. 
Um, there's three main modes of operation. We can scan back and forth and capture flux, measure the flux detected by the pickup loop. In that case, we're basically measuring the magnetic field at the height of the pickup loop convolved with the shape of the pickup loop. Um, and then we can get better spatial resolution, better spatial resolution in principle by deconvolving it. Um, but what's hard to compensate for is the height. So people generally think that our spatial resolution is limited by the size of the pickup loop. It's really not. The deconvolution is really straightforward. It's really limited by the height. It's quite hard to propagate the detected signal back down to the, uh, to the surface area. Um, the second measurement method that we can use is sesoptometry, where we have a pickup loop and another coil. We put a current through this other coil, and then we can measure the change in the mutual inductance of the pickup loop field coil pair. And then the third thing is if we pass a current through the sample, we can just do direct imaging of the current that's flowing through the sample. Um, you know, over the years, I, I've used this for testing a number of predictions. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of condensed matter physics um, really involves like very creative um, acts of genius by theorists who spend a lot of time thinking through what might arise in condensed matter systems. And one of the main things I've done in the past uh, quarter century of my career is um, look for predicted effects that actually weren't there. So that's uh, that's kind of a bummer, but it's nice to know that they're not there so that we can move on. But there's all kinds of ways, I hope I've said enough about vortices and quantum fluids that you can see that there's all kinds of ways that the structure or behavior of the vortices would give you a good test of what the underlying phase, what the underlying state of the material is. Okay, so, uh, so as I mentioned, vortices and superconductors are quantized. So um, the vortices that you see in bulk superconductors are often called Abrakosov vortices. Um, they carry a superconducting flux quantum. The superconductor is usually described by a single order parameter, but it could be described by multiple order parameters. So the order parameter is also sometimes called a pseudo wave function, and it has both a magnitude and a phase. The uh, magnitude squared of the order parameter basically results from how many carriers are present in the sample, and the phase of the order parameter basically results from the fact that it is, in fact, a quantum fluid. So when I call it a pseudo wave function or an order parameter, uh, what I mean is that it's a complex number. It's called a pseudo wave function. It's called a pseudo wave function because it doesn't exactly obey Schrodinger's equation, but it does obey some differential equations very close to the critical temperature. Those are the Gisbert-Landau equations um, below the critical temperature. It's quite remarkable how much it looks like it follows the Ginsburg-Landau equations, even though microscopically you can't show that it should. Um, the main point, though, is that it acts like a quantum fluid. Um, in the presence of a phase gradient or a magnetic vector potential, current flows, and that leads to flux quantization in the amount such that when you have vorticity in the sample, you can count up the amount of the vorticity in units of H over 2E. And 2E is assuming that you have a superconductor that has where the where there's superconducting pairing, so the charge carriers have charge 2E, which is pretty much every known superconductor. Okay, and that's all been known for a very long time. Um, there's a lot of exotic superconductors, and a lot of uh, work has gone into discovering exotic superconductors, looking for things that might be exotic superconductors, predicting things that might be exotic superconductors, and characterizing them. And you know, they often have a certain superficial similarity. Um, sometimes they have a superficial similarity because there tend to be antiferromagnetic states, spin density waves, charge density waves that are adjacent to a superconducting dome. Um, and that's, that's probably for uh, very valid and typical reasons. Um, another feature of unconventional superconductors is that because they can have very complicated material structures. So for example, these are some of the cuprate superconductors. This is a small fraction of the known cuprate superconductors, but here there is just the formulas of three hole doped and four known electron doped uh, superconductors, and uh, they have very, very similar, very similar phase diagrams. Um, there can be many candidate order parameters, S wave, D wave, G wave, linear combinations of the different order parameters and superconductors, and uh, the order parameters um, look like a uh, 
pairing state and case space. So it's common to see diagrams like these on the right describing different order parameters. I want to talk you through, although it's not actually at all essential to my talk, I just want to take a moment to talk you through what, this, what these sketches mean because it's very common to see them in talks about exotic superconductivity. Actually, when the cuprate superconductors were first discovered, people like defined exotic superconductivity as being a non-S wave superconductor. That's not the case anymore. It's completely common to have non-S wave pairing. But basically, uh, the distance from the distance of this line from the origin is the strength of the pairing in that direction in K space. Okay, and then the presence of a sign or another phase that's more complicated than a sign, which sometimes happen, indicates that that's the phase of the order parameter in that direction in k-space with respect to other directions in k-space. Okay, so these, the, the structure of the Cooper pair, if you want, can be very, very complicated. Just like the structure of the orbitals of atoms can be very complicated and either carry angular momentum or not carry angular momentum. Um, for the purposes of this talk, the main point is that there's many candidates. They're different from each other. And in principle, you can have combinations of them. Um, this is a graph that uh, Jenny Hoffman, my former postdoc, made when the nictite superconductors were discovered. I like it because it really shows like how quickly a field can explode. You know, the first nictite superconductors were discovered in 2006 um, with critical temperatures that are pretty high critical temperatures, but still below 10 Kelvin. But as you can see, like in 2008 and 2009, there was this huge explosion of discovery of many different variants of nictite superconductors, um, which had uh, very different critical temperatures, but eventually the family as a whole capped out at having uh, maximum critical temperatures in the 60 Kelvin range. Um, and I show this both as a sign of like hope that when there are when there's a new avenue to superconductivity the community can activate very quickly and really map out many different options for what the superconductivity can be and also you know it's a little bit daunting because you know if you're if you're looking for each of these things by the way you know you can you can vary the you can vary the relative ratios of some of these components and, and generate a superconducting dome so if you're looking for exotic phenomena you really have a lot of parameter space to explore. Right? Okay. Um, so, uh, for example, the, the iron arsenide superconductors have this iron arsenide plane, and you can dope them with something. For example, here I'm doping them with cobalt. Um, actually, the rest of this movie is kind of complicated, so for those of you who aren't experts in the subfield, just ignore the rest of this movie. Um, but um, I included this movie because I wanted to show to the experts in the field, just a reminder of the extent to which the properties of the superconductor can vary tremendously on a local level, depending on how the dopant atoms are clustered. And I think that that problem is not nearly sufficiently I'm not sure well. I, understand. <laughs> I think that problem is not nearly sufficiently well <laughs> studied. Um, not, not, not in, uh, not in complex bolt superconductors, and also not in model systems. And one of the exciting things that I learned about today is that that's being studied to some degree in the Shivani lab, and I think it's a very interesting, promising uh, area of research. So I, I ran and added this movie back in. Okay, we can talk more about the movie later. Okay, now in principle, Igor Baba Ev predicted in 2002 and promptly started emailing me saying, could you look for this? Could you look for this? Your lab should look for this. So that if a superconductor is described by multiple order parameters, um, you could have different wave functions labeled by J, and then you still have a current flowing in the presence of phase gradients or magnetic vector potentials. But if, like in this sketch that I drew over here, um, you have phase winding only in one of the bands, you get a fractional vortex. Now, I said fractional vortex here, and I said unquantized vortex in the talk. I actually think, in the title, I think it's actually probably better to call it an unquantized vortex, because when I hear fractional vortex, I want it to be like a half, or, you know, 37 sixty-eighths, you know, or actually a fraction. But what I really mean is it's partial vortex, and the amplitude of the amount of flux that's carried in that vortex will depend on what the number, what the carrier density in that channel is. 
Okay. Um, so these, these, these partial vortices or fractional vortices would be not integral, and they would probably be temperature dependent because the amount of flux that's carried in, this, in the two bands, there's no reason why that would have a constant fraction as a function of temperature. Um, so again, just for the people who are on Zoom and couldn't see the sketch that I drew on the board, and also for anybody who wasn't paying attention in the first minute of the talk, um, you could imagine that you have a purple fluid, you have a single fluid, let's call it the purple fluid. The purple fluid has a vortex. Uh, that vortex generates a flux quantum whose magnitude is HC over 2E as expected in any conventional superconductors. In principle, you could have two fluids. In principle, according to Igor Babaev, but not according to many other theorists, you could have two fluids that are, have just the right weak coupling between them such that you would get a vortex in the pink fluid and a vortex in the blue fluid that could separate by some distance, even by quite a long distance. Okay, and uh, Igor Babaev suggested that we look for this material in the potassium doped barium iron arsenide. Uh, this uh, material has a very complicated structure, very complicated phase diagram. Um, the y-axis here is temperature, the uh, x-axis is x, which is the amount of potassium doping. Um, and it appears that in the green region here, there appears to be a uh, nodeless uh, superconductor. In the orange region here, there appears to be a nodal superconductor. Um, the experts in the field know what I mean by nodeless and nodal, and I'm happy to talk about it otherwise. And this relatively narrow range of doping here, there appears to be a time reversal symmetry breaking state which has been hypothesized to have S plus IS superconductivity, so uh, two types of S-wave superconductivity with a complex phase in between them. Um, and uh, so this is where uh, it was suggested that we look for these fractional vortices. The fact that time reversal symmetry was broken in the exact sample that we looked at was checked by our collaborator in both muon spin relaxation and Nernst measurements. And that seems to imply that fractional vortices might be stable in that material. Um, to be clear again, when uh, Dr. Gucci decided to look at this, I did not actually think that fractional vortices would show up in this sample. Yeah. But you know, it's always worth looking. Because as I said, I've kind of made a career out of checking like really interesting predictions, and it's always fun to like at least set some upper limit on them. Yes? So you emphasized that the, that the effect was reproduced by different labs on the same sample. Is it reproducible from sample to sample? Um, yes. Um, it's, so, um, there's a, there's a mm, somewhat reproducible from sample to sample. You know, with, with samples like this, there is a very non-trivial issue of, you know, getting the exact right doping, and not only getting the exact right doping, but also, um, I believe that it matters not only what the average doping in the sample is, but also how uniform the disorder in the sample is. And so I think there's still quite a lot of work to be done on what the relevant like nanoscopic length scales are and how many materials in this class of like chemical doping induced unconventional materials probably have much more nanoscale texture than what we've previously appreciated. Yeah, and I think some of that is, and I think scanning tunneling microscopy to date is the best method for verifying that, and I think has seen that in many different cases. I think there's other cases where there's still more verification that can be done slightly subsurface. And as I said, I think that the, um, I think the idea of, a, you know, of a doped semiconductor um, is just a fantastic model system for, you know, sort of exploring how to, how to assess those. So I would say it's rel relatively reproducible from sample to sample. Um, and the effect that I'm about to show you that we saw in our lab is reproducible in the samples that we've looked at in that doping range. Yeah. Yes? What drives the time reversal symmetry breaking? Um, yeah. I, I don't actually know. Yeah. Because that's odd, no? When odd to have time reversal symmetry breaking? In a superconductor? Yeah. Um, it's not that odd. Um, you, you mean odd in the sense of unusual, not in yeah, the sense yeah, of like odd, odd parity. Exactly. Um, <laughs> that would but, be even um, more odd. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it, it's actually, so it's, it's, I would say it's rare, so yeah, in that sense it's unusual, but it's not at all implausible. No, no, um, no. Yeah, so there's no, there's no particular reason why you wouldn't have a chiral superconductor. No, yeah. but I mean, I just was asking because it might be relevant for the four dishes. Yes, yes. If there is like some berry phase that gets picked up by the time reversal symmetry breaking, then why would things be quantized? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, just to repeat what we're going to do with the sizes that we're actually using it. This is the actual pickup loop. This is the actual geometry of the actual pickup loop field coil pair that we used in this case. Again, we have a gradientometric shielded device, and we can use the pickup loop to detect local magnetic flux. Um, and we can also use the field coil to apply a local current. And then when we apply the local current, we can use that local current in a DC usually fashion, but DC or AC, sorry, this should say I sub FC for I sub field coil, um, to create and manipulate isolated vortices. We can also put an AC current through that field coil, and then we can measure the superfluid density and the penetration depth, and therefore the anticipated spatial extent of the vortices um, by measuring the change in the mutual inductance of that field coil pickup loop pair as it approaches the superconductor. The stronger the superconductor is, the higher the superfluid density is, the shorter the penetration depth is, the more the mutual inductance will change as this pickup loop field coil pair approaches the surface. So we can use that to get an independent check of what the lateral extent of the vortex should be. Okay, so I'll show you all three of these measurement modes. Um, here is uh, something that we see all the time, all the time. So uh, here is a superconductor. Um, we uh, cool down from 25 Kelvin to 10 and a half Kelvin um, with no current in the field coil, then image the sample surface, see nothing. Cool down with uh, two milliamps of current in the field coil creating a local field. We see a, a vortex and two anti-vortices labeled CV because they're conventional vortices, okay? Um, and then here again, we see uh, a couple of anti-vortices. I forgot now which ones I called anti-vortices. Did I call the black ones anti-vortices or the white ones? It doesn't matter, right? Okay, let's call the white ones vortices. So we see a couple of anti-vortices in the center and three vortices, conventional vortices nearby. We can zoom in on these. We can establish their flux colonization uh, pretty accurately. And then here, you can't see it here. But here, if we put a little more current in the field coil, we have these like strange little features over here, which if I blow up the color scale, so here it goes from minus 80 to 80 millifinop through the pickup loop. Here it goes from minus 10 to 10 millifinop through the pickup loop. You can see there's this little dark feature there, little dark feature there, little light feature there. We don't usually see that. That's very weird and unusual to have a little monopole of flux show up in a superconductor below the critical temperature, unless that monopole of flux carries a flux quantum. Okay, so to check whether it's the fractional vortices that Igor asked us to look for, we wanna do three checks. First of all, verify whether the total flux is only part of a full flux quantum. Second of all, check whether they're mobile objects because you might have already thought of the fact that they might arise from some magnetic impurity effect or from some partial vorticity associated with a weak link. Um, and check whether the amplitude is consistent across the sample for each temperature because if so, that would be suggestive of the fact that it's indicating the fraction of the um, superfluid density that's in one of the superconducting order parameters. Um, so first of all, here's our fractional vortices. Um, here's a conventional vortex. We can model the conventional vortex using well-known models in which a flux tube coming up to the surface of the superconductor, when it hits the surface of the superconductor, it spreads out. So if you're even a small distance above the surface of the superconductor, it looks like it's source from a monopole. We use that to calibrate the, our, our point spread function all the time. Um, and so this is a simulation of a um, conventional vortex um, carrying a flux quantum using the London penetration depth that we determined from the mutual susceptibility measurements that I mentioned. Um, on the other hand, here are the fractional vortices. 
And here are models for a 0.3 finite point source using the same value as the penetration depth. Um, so yes, the total flux is only a part of the flux quantum. Second of all, are they mobile? We can check if they're mobile in two different ways. This is a fractional vortex. Um, the background striation that you see here is uh, due to, um, it's just due to sine wave pickup in the electronic system because it's, it's a pretty small signal. Um, so if you cool the sample, the fractional vortex moves. If you see a fractional vortex in a similar region and you heat the sample, the fractional vortex moves. Also, if you put a current through the field coil, that puts a force on the fractional vortex, and the fractional vortex moves when you put a current through the field coil. So yes, these vortices are mobile. They're not arising from magnetic impurities in the sample that we somehow activated with our field coil. Um, OK. And then the third question, whether the amplitude is consistent across the sample for each temperature. And here are, uh, here's a conventional vortex. Here's a point model. Here's some fits to that at different temperatures using different uh, values of the uh, London penetration depth. Um, here's the uh, inferred penetration depth from the vortices and from susceptibility measurements, which is not quite the same, but it's not completely inconsistent. Um, and then, so here's the conventional vortex peak flux as a function of temperature. Um, here's the fractional vortex peak flux as a function of temperature. Um, here's fitting to the fractional vortices. The fits aren't as good. We constrain the penetration depth to be the same. Um, they look a little bit broader, but they're clearly still carrying fractional flux. And here is the amount of flux carried by vortices and anti-vortices in three different regions of the sample as a function of temperature. So overall, pretty consistent. Okay. So the amplitude and its temperature dependence are consistent in different locations, which suggests that the amplitude depends on the material's order parameter. Um, and that's it. That's what I wanted to show you. Um, we saw vortices carrying a temperature-dependent part of a flux quantum in the multiband bulk superconductor, potassium, doped, barium, iron arsenide. Um, and the temperature-dependent fraction is uniform for each temperature in the sample. So I think the main next question is, what is the order parameter that's associated with this fractional vortex? And I hope that the temperature dependence will inform new microscopic models, including potentially um, trying to tease out the questions of why a time reversal symmetry breaking order parameter um, might turn out to be the favorable order parameter in this particular material and why. Um, I want to thank my collaborators again. Um, Dr. Yusuke Iguchi is the first author on this paper. Um, he is a postdoc in my group who, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, stepped up to become a senior staff scientist and help, help uh, manage the lab through the pandemic while I was managing Stanford University research through the pandemic. Um, and uh, also, uh, he and Ruby Shi um, took all of the scanning squid data that I've shown you in this talk. Um, I really want to thank um, Igor Babaev and his students who did some calculations of what the fractional vortices might look like in the multiband model and for 20 years has been bugging me to do these experiments. Um, uh, 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 Professor Grudenko um, at Shanghai Jitong, uh, Jitong University in China for doing the characterizations of the material, including the specific samples that we studied, because um, it's really a bummer to use scanning squid to end up doing characterization of a sample that's not ready. Um, and Ki Hao and Li for doing the single crystal growth of these samples. So um, yeah. That's pretty much what I wanted to say, and thank you again for your attention. Right. So, um, so I guess that the idea was, at least what you drew there, that these things come in pair or, or some version. Yeah. So in the one that you showed, it looked like isolated. So is there another one across, or, or, or how should we think about it? Yeah, there are other ones that are, that are nearby, although knowing how far away they are. So it's actually not all that, it's maybe less surprising that to see two that are relatively close to each other. Um, but you know, the extent to which these are really pretty far away from any possible pairs is, any possible pairs is, is really pretty striking. So I, I don't have it in this talk, but there are, uh, so in this one, I don't know where the pair is. I don't know where the other part of the pair is in that one. There are other ones where we have the pairs nearby each other, 
and we can add them up and see that they look like a conventional vortex, just slightly broadened. I see, and it looks like one time. Is that that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, re regular ab abrecos of flux lines don't cross. Mm -hmm. How about these ones? Um, so, I think they can cross in rare, regular abrecos up lines can cross in rare circumstances. The energy barrier to crossing is extremely high. Um, the, um, I don't know whether these ones cross or not, I would think it would be easier for them to cross. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you have like a conventional full vortex coming up and then it splits into a branch with two partial vortices in it. But all of that needs to be modeled with some microscopic understanding, which, which we don't have. Okay. Okay. So you were pretty clear that, that you don't know yet what the order parameter is, mm -hmm. but um, in, in the conventional flux line, the, the order parameter goes to zero at the core, and so you have a normal core. Mm -hmm. Do you think that these are, that the core of these excitations, or whatever they are, is, is still somewhat superconducting, or is it normal? I think it would have to be still somewhat superconducting. Yeah. So I think it would be a very interesting thing to explore with scanning tunneling microscopy. But I think the barrier to doing that with scanning tunneling microscopy is finding them because the, the you know yeah. this is just like miles and miles for an STM. But yeah, I think it's something that I hope people will work on. Do you know how to control the density of them, or do you just find them by chance? Can you like ramp an external field and get more fractional vortices? No, we can ramp an external field and get more conventional vortices. Yes. Yeah, we've only seen these isolated vortices. We've only seen the fractional vortices <coughs> when we're working in the limit that we're generating isolated vortices. Why is that? Um, I mean, why don't they form when you go up a flux lattice? Or do they? Well, uh, we, we haven't, we haven't uh, made them at that density. Um, but again, like it, you would need to do some modeling with a two component. I mean, if I just did naive modeling with a two component Ginsburg Landau parameter, it would seem to me that it would be energetically favorable for the two fractional vortices to combine with each other. So I think the existence of the fractional vortices is probably metastable because if you have a partial suppression of the superfluid density of one and a partial suppression of the superfluid density of the other, you know, whatever coupling term there is, would make it, would make like, so if you have a, you know, if you have a pink fractional vortex, I would think that the pink fractional vortex would, um, would act like a pinning site for the blue fractional vortex, at least once it gets like actually on top of it. So I would think that if we put in more and more of them, they would find each other and combine. But again, I think that's a thing to simulate in Ginsburg-Landau. I'm just speculating. Yeah. So you showed us 0.3 flux quanta fractional vortices. Do you see other flavors as well? Um, we only see this temperature dependence. Um, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so this isn't all the vortices we've ever seen, but they're they're all within this band of the temperature dependence. I would say, yeah. So the fra so the um, the fraction is you know temperature dependent, ranging like sort of up to 0.3. Um, and much below TC, they don't seem to be metastable. Yeah. Some other questions. I mean, this takes a lot of effort, I guess, but you, one can go to the other uh, spectrum of X and also do this experiment. Is that something that can be done, or they're not superconduct? I guess they are superconduct. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, we didn't see them. Yeah. So um, we've looked at other dopings, and have, we haven't looked at all other dopings, but we've looked at some other dopings and not seen these, which further supports the speculation that, they're, uh, that they are there where they were predicted to be because of the multi-component order parameter. Yes. But again, I think that needs to be done. Like a next step is definitely to do that much more systematically. Okay. Yeah. And did this theory say something about the ratio of uh, quantized versus regular? Versus uh, uh, partial vortices uh, for a given magnetic field. 
Um, like basically, what is the chance to see the Swissery Vortex over the regular ones? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, it might say something, but I'm not sure I would believe it because I think they're metastable, so I think that their ability to exist must depend on the local fitting potential and the right. conditions in which they were created. Um, so I think it would be quite hard to calculate the ratio, um, you know, sort of a priori. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in equilibrium, actually, you only expect to see the regular vortices. Then. That's that's my naive speculation. Yeah. If you put on a current, mm -hmm. you should get a force on them. Yeah. And they should be pinned. But the thing that bothers me is usually what damps them is the normal core. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you say the normal core isn't is not there, what happens? Well, so I think there's, um, I think there's still a core, but I think the superfluid density might be suppressed in one channel and not in the other channel. So I think they would still be dissipative when they move. Um, but uh, for sure, definitely. So we didn't, we didn't put a transport current on, but we put a current through the field coil, which causes the current to flow underneath the field coil because it is it right, and that does move them. So they do get pushed around by currents as you'd expect. And you don't see a difference in how they move. I mean, we haven't done it that quantitatively yet. We were checking that they did move, right? This is That's still probably, this the, is still the quite. The pinning recent. is probably different. So. The pinning is probably different. Yeah, but but you can see from these, you can see from these that they moved and stopped. They didn't like move and keep moving ballistically across the sample in the way that I think you're speculating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions. Let's thank him.